Does Gita really deserve to be the champion of Paldea? When you look at her roster, she has some good Pokemon to be sure, but I don't know if she deserves to be at the very top. In order to find out, I am attempting a hardcore Nuzlocke of Pokemon Violet, but I can only use Pokemon that Gita has on her team. Before we begin, let me know which of Gita's wide array of Pokemon is your favorite. For me, it is easily Glamora, and you'll see why in this run. The first challenge is to look like her. After spending longer than I care to admit on this character creation, I have gotten as close as I think is possible, though I did mess up the name. Even after playing through this game twice, I somehow thought her name was Greta. Apparently, I can't read, though I do eventually realize my mistake and I fix it. And I am stunned by how purple everything in this game is. I guess I'm already used to Scarlet. Nimona, the child who allegedly already defeated me, wants to try again. So I choose the water duck, making Nimona take Fuenco. But by the time I make it to the beach, Ace the duck has magically transformed into Glimmit, Gita's real starter Pokemon. How did I do that, you might ask? Don't worry about it. Instead, ask yourself how Nimona, who apparently thinks Rock Throw is a water move, even made it to the Elite Four. What is wrong with that girl? My apparently water Glimmit and I defeat this loser and am almost forced to catch a Lechonk. But there's no room on my team for a stinking pig. I meet the futuristic version of Corridan who flies. So naturally, he's better. Sorry to all of you 10 Corridan fans out there. Even though I'm an adult, I decide to enroll in the Grape Academy, where I find my doppelganger. This lady has stolen my identity and my Pokemon. So my entire purpose in life is to now take this duplicate down. And yes, I have to admit she looked awesome, but that's not the point here. I bust out of the grape to begin the arduous process of, once again, redefeating all the gym leaders. After, I have some fun riding a Tron cycle. I've got to admit, that's a bit cooler than riding on some galloping lizard. Okay, on to the bug gym. Caddy starts with Nimble, as I send out the only Pokemon I have. But he's also the only one I need, because both the Nimble and the Tarantula fall to a single Ancient Power apiece. The Bugbear does survive one hit, just to miss with Fury Cutter, and then dies on the next turn. So far so good, I say after beating literally one gym. Now I could have Terrastalized to take out the Bugbear, but at this point in the game, I hadn't yet decided if I was going to allow that. Spoiler alert, I do. This would be a lot harder without it. In preparation for Gym 2, I do some pretty extensive traveling to get the Sludge Bomb TM, which is a 90 base power special attacking move. By the way, Glitten has pretty incredible special attack, so this move will be awesome. I then amass an army of Sunflora to try and get my position as champion back, but they just won't listen to me. It's hard finding good henchmen nowadays. They keep asking about insurance and crap like that. Brassius, the grass gym leader, leads with his pedal. I set up a rock polish as he tries to put me to sleep, but to no avail. Next turn, a super effective sludge bomb takes him out. The small olive also dies to some sludge. Now the pseudo wudo has sturdy, so he survives the hit, of course, and uses trailblaze. If I hadn't rock polished earlier, he would now outspeed me. As it is, I was guaranteed to survive even a crit, meaning I win on the next turn with just a bit more sludge. My underling, Hassel, appears to not know who I am, even though we've worked together at the Pokemon League for years. What did I tell you? Good henchmen are hard to come by. I'm already the champion, Hassel. Stop lecturing me about Pokemon. I know more about them than you ever did. After a good amount of rock climbing, I eventually find and catch a Skiddo. Woohoo! Two whole Pokemon! But I spoke too soon because next I get a Flittle in the desert. Though prior to evolving, he kinda sucks, so I'm gonna avoid using him. There's another Nimona fight here, but Ace just so happens to get the Ancient Power Omni Boost on turn 1, meaning that all her Pokemon are belong to me. The Crocolore does survive a hit, but can't actually do anything to me anyway. I knew that was going to be easy, but the Omni Boost made it trivial. The Where's Waldo gym test was cool the first time I did it, but at this point, 
I'm just kind of tired of it. Actually, I'm tired of most of the gym tests, to be honest. I wish I could skip them. Oh well. I couldn't come up with a reliable strat against Iono as my Pokemon were. So, I spent a lot of time exploring to get more TMs. Specifically, to get bulk up and rest. And because we haven't seen the front of Gita nearly enough, and I spent a long time working on it, here's my face. Why not? Iono starts with Waltrill as I lead with Skittles. But I immediately pivot into Ace on a baited out pluck to spread my toxic spikes everywhere. Which actually may not have been the best idea, and you'll see why soon enough. Anyway, a single Ancient Power takes out the Watril. I was hoping for another Omni Boost here, but I didn't expect it. Her Belly Bolt is poisoned as soon as he comes out, and I swap back to Skittles on what I thought was a Water Gun. Now this is where things get pretty boring, because I need to set up as many bulk ups as I possibly can. I get immediately paralyzed, which isn't great, but I do have rest, so hopefully it's okay. The problem is that I miscalculated my turns. I thought I would have enough time for another bulk up, rest, heal, and then trailblaze to knock him out. But that didn't actually happen. The Luxio comes out and intimidates me, which isn't great, but it's what it is. I decide to risk a crit for another bulk up, and with all my attack, a trailblaze is now enough to take him out. I needed two speed boosts here so I could outspeed and take out the Miss Magius. Or, you know, not. Thankfully, the ghost decides to confuse me, but I had a Persimberry just in case. Basically, my strategy would have worked a lot better if I didn't poison the Belly Bolt. I would have had as much time as I needed to set up bulk ups, and I wouldn't have almost lost Skittles. I encounter the clone Gita, who introduces herself using my name. Identity theft is not a joke. Millions of Pokemon trainers suffer every year. I need to get even stronger so I can overthrow her reign of evil. After getting some yucky seaweed, it's time for another encounter. I find a female Ponyard who I catch and name Queen Amit, because she's a girl. And this girl will be immediately useful in the Kofu fight, after yet another one of my underlings gives me the cold shoulder. I'll show you, I'll show all of you. Kofu starts with Velusa, a fish that will eventually be on the team, as I lead with Queen Amit. I didn't actually realize there was a sandstorm here before the fight began, so hopefully that doesn't ruin my plans. The Queen, surprisingly, outspeeds to hit with an assurance that almost kills the fish before taking some decent damage with an Aqua Cutter. I wanted to leave with Skittles, but this fish has pluck, so that wouldn't work. Either way, it goes down next turn. For the not Doug Trio, I pivot to Skittles on a Water Pulse, and after taking a headbutt, finish it off with a Terra Seed Bomb. Last is the now Water Crab Omnibal, who falls to a single Miracle Seed Terra Boosted Seed Bomb. And that's a mouthful. If the Wug Trio's Water Pulse had confused me, my plan was to just swap to remove the confusion, but with the extra damage from Sandstorm, that actually might have put me at risk to a crit. So I'm glad it didn't come to that. After the fight, Nimona appears again but to show me that she's not a creepy stalker, she decides to not try to beat me up this time. Gee, thanks, I guess. Instead, I manage to escape her overtight clutches and promptly have an evolution fest, where my entire team evolves, with the exception of Ponyard. I still think it's really stupid he doesn't evolve until level 52. Why'd they do her so dirty like that? Anyway, with an almost fully evolved team, hopefully things will be a bit easier. In the next gym, Nimona acts like every other childhood bully and threatens to beat me up after school. What is with this woman? She never gives up. I start and then finish the most difficult gym test by far. But what I really want to know is where did those patrons go? They were just sitting there eating their food, no cares in the world, and then all of a sudden they fall down to the trap door, never to be seen again? That's messed up, but who cares? It's time to face off against Normie Larry. I leave with Ace, and decide to set up some stealth rocks as I get yawned. But that's fine, because I immediately pivot to Ponyard on another yawn for some reason. I use Assurance and get yawned again. What is this koala thinking exactly? The queen needs her beauty sleep, so I pivot back to Ace on a slam that misses, which is actually unfortunate. Thankfully though, he uses a priority sucker punch to hit me, which spreads some toxic spikes all on the ground and then he falls to a sludge bomb. 
the Dun Dun Sparse comes out to take some Stealth Rocks damage and gets poisoned. Sucks to be you. I stall with Spiky Shield and at this point I should be able to take him out. But just in case, I become a Terra Rock, losing my Poison type, so now Ground is only two times effective, though it was unnecessary because a Venoshock takes him out. The Staraptor doesn't get poisoned, but he does take a decent chunk of damage from the stones. I again use a spiky shield to deal some free damage, and then take him out with one more Sludge Bomb. As much as I'd like to revel in my victory here, I immediately have another Nimona fight, and I can't even change my Pokemon around. What's worse though, is that the counterfeit Gita gets to watch and see all of my strategies. That's not fair. Against the Lycanroc, I get some free damage with Spiky Shield, and then spread Toxic Spikes and Stealth Rocks in the same turn. Skittles comes out on an Accelerock and takes out the dog in two Trailblazes. The Gumi, who comes out next, as well as the Pomo, both die to Earthquakes. Even with all of the entry hazards, the Skeledurge could survive an Earthquake. So, I decide to pivot back to Ace, even though I don't have any rock moves right now. I don't take too much from a Terra Boosted Torch Song, and then, again, waste a turn with Spiky Shield. Thankfully, this croc is no longer Ghost-type, so a double-powered Venoshock is enough to take him out. That was a close one, actually. You know, my favorite part about Gym 6 is MC Sledge. Just look at that guy. He is so into it. I get a makeover before the 6th Gym, and finally find out I can remove my hat. To be fair, I haven't really worried about changing or buying clothes in any of my other playthroughs, but it's nice to know I can remove the hat. After all, Gita doesn't wear one, and I should know because I am Gita. That's what the run's all about. The Ghost Gym is actually really easy, even though her Pokemon seem to have some sort of obsession with targeting Ace with priority moves. I don't know what's up with that, but an expert belted Ponyard is more than strong enough to take out basically her whole team with Night Slashes. And getting the attack boosts certainly helps, though it's not necessary. On the second turn, Ace, with a Hardstone boosted Power Gem, takes out the Mimikyu as Queen takes out the Hound. That only leaves Toxtricity, who immediately dies. That fight only took three turns, which is basically as fast as it can be. I told you things would be easier now that everybody's evolving. I skipped this encounter earlier because it wasn't necessary, but now we get Flathead the Bergmite. I also spent a good long while trying to find a Volusa in the water areas that he's supposed to be in, but I'm not having any luck. I do eventually find one in this lake, but I was avoiding this region because she ends up being level 50. So even after catching her, I can't use her until we get to the Elite Four. Before we get to Gym 7, there is yet another Nimona fight. Why is this girl so obsessed with me? An expert belted Skittle demolishes almost her whole team. I mean, the Lycanroc goes down in one hit after using Sand Attack. The Sligo takes two hits, but doesn't do all that much to me in the process. I do miss the first Earthquake against Palmot because of the Sand Attack, which allows him to paralyze me. But then he's Earthquaked on the next turn. Against the Skeledurge, I pivot to Ace on a Torch Song just like last time. But now I actually have a rock move. So a Terra Hardstone boosted Power Gem wins me the fight. That was a lot smoother than last time. And speaking of smooth, we meet Tulip. Lil Fiddle leads the charge for his first major battle, but I only needed him to bait out a crunch. That way Ace can come in and spread some toxic spikes. I pivot again to Queen Amet to avoid a Zen headbutt. And just look at how tiny this little pawny art is. She's so cute. That little frame though, packs an expert belted punch to knock out the giraffe in two night slashes. The Gardevoir is then baited out, so I swap again to Ace to tank a dazzling gleam. And you probably know what's coming next. Venoshock, of course. I love this move. A Venoshock also takes out her Espathra, which was about as useful as mine was. And then the now Psychic Flower gets poisoned so I waste a turn with Spiky Shield, just because I can. This thing has really good special defense, but not so good regular defense. Meaning, I pivot to Queen yet again on a Psychic move. And now, I decide to lose my Dark type, just in case Night Slash doesn't kill her, even though I'm confident it will. And it does. There was a lot of swapping around in that fight, but I thought it was a pretty reasonable strategy. 
and a good way to end this section of the game. I mean, technically, there is still an 8th gym battle against this whale. It's cool they made a Pokemon a gym leader, but Ace, with an expert belt and Terra Rock, just destroys the entire team. I did consider trying a more complicated strategy, but I just wanted to absolutely wreck the last gym just to show everyone what Gita is made of. For my incredible victory, the phony Gita taunts me one last time, but I can tell she's getting scared, as she should be, because I'm almost ready to overthrow her. But first, I take Piranha, the Velusa, out of the box. After eight whole gyms, I finally have a full team of six. That only took, you know, the entire game. Queen then evolves into Bisharp, and together we invade other Bisharp's territory. To be honest, if it were up to me, I might not evolve Queen Amit here, because as buff as King Amit is, he loses 20 speed. And everyone knows the slogan of Pokemon, gotta go fast. But since Gita does use King Amit, I decide I need to be true to that spirit and evolve her. And now we're ready for the Elite Four. At the very last second, the ripoff Gita tries to convince me not to go through with unmasking her charade, but this is my purpose in life. I try to convince Rika who I actually am through an interview, but she isn't convinced. And so, the only way to prove myself worthy is to defeat the entire Elite Four. But that's what I was here to do anyway. We start with Rika. Skittles knocks out the Wish Cache with a single Expert Belted Leaf Blade. No surprise there. And then the camera upped with a single Earthquake. Again, no surprise. Against the Dawn Fan, anticipating a Poison Jab, I pivot into Ace, who has a Rocky Helmet. This not only spreads Toxic Spikes, but also breaks the Dawn Fan's Sturdy, allowing me to bring Skittles back out on an Earthquake to kill and then heal with a Horn Leech. I've been waiting for this move for quite a while, actually. The Doug Trio outspeeds me with a Sandstorm, but still falls in one hit. Last is the Claude Sire, who loses his Poison type and then also falls in a single hit. Well, that was an easy start. Now it's on to Poppy. Her elephant looks intimidating, but like the old saying goes, the bigger they are, the more damage Low Cake does. This immediately brings out Corviknight. So I pivot to Piranha on a body press and heal with some leftovers. I use a Surf and then take a Brave Bird in the process. I pivot to Ace on another Brave Bird, who still has a Rocky Helmet, bringing this bird down to the red. Now I could easily kill him with a power gem, but let's see if I can take him out with a spiky shield instead. And I do. Nice. Making that bird take himself out, good stuff. Against Bronzong, I swap to Queen Amit on an earthquake, which was not the best move, but I can still take him out in one hit. I thought about having an air balloon on her, but instead opted for a cherry berry in case the magnet who comes out next paralyzes me. Instead, it decides to use a light screen, which is pointless because I destroy it with a brick break and knock out the magnet at the same time. Against the Tinkaton, I bring out Flathead, who takes a brick break like a champ and heals with some leftovers. Anticipating a big ol' hammer, I use Protect and avoid getting kicked. Nice! Since she can only use that move every other turn, I feel like I'm pretty safe. I take a play rough, for some reason, and do a lot with Earthquake, but it doesn't quite kill. Next turn I protect against a Stone Edge? That was supposed to be a hammer, meaning she's probably going to use it next turn. All right, let's risk a crit. The hammer doesn't crit, so I survive and take out the cute hammer wielder next turn. I wonder why he used a play rough and a Stone Edge before the hammer again. That was kind of weird. Against Larry, I did consider letting Flathead try to take this one, but decided to just let Ace do his thing. Turns out, his thing is to brutally humiliate Larry by taking out all of his Pokemon with Power Gems. He never even stood a chance. I mean, the Flamingo might have survived if he stayed a fighting type. Better luck next time, Larry. And believe it or not, I'm expecting a similarly easy fight against Hassel. Noivern uses a Super Fang to take me below half HP, activating Piranha Citrus Berry. This, in turn, ensures that I can use Filet Away which takes half my HP in exchange for greatly boosting my attack, special attack, and speed. Meaning, next turn, I outspeed and take out the bat with an Ice Beam. The Poison Dragon may be too strong for my Ice Beam, but not a stab stored power. 
because it now has 140 power thanks to all of my stat boosts. As expected, the Haxorus, as well as the Flapple, go down to a single Ice Beam apiece. The Backscalibur will not go down so easy, unfortunately. But that's okay, I planned to sack Piranha here and let almost anyone else come out to finish the fight. Unless Piranha decides to freeze the dragon. Huh, I guess she had other plans. That random bit of luck means that Piranha survives and wins the match with another stored power. I didn't really need her for the next fight, but since she's still alive, let's try to use her, shall we? After thoroughly trouncing the entire Elite Four, they now back me up as the real Gita. The only problem is that she is technically still the champion, so I need to defeat her to take the title. I mean, I have now shown that Gita's team is strong enough to become the champion, so that question is basically already answered. But now the question is whether Gita's team is strong enough to take out Gita's team. Let's find out. Fake Gita leads with her Lil Fiddle against my Queen Emmet. I tank a Dazzling Gleam and then respond with a Kowtow Cleave for the knockout. I use Protect against the fake Flathead just to heal with leftovers and pivot to none other than Ace. He has an Air Balloon just to avoid any random earthquake this iceberg might have used and then responds with a Power Gem for the win after spreading some toxic spikes. I use a spiky shield on the Belusa to deal some extra damage and then knock it out with a sludge wave. And even though it's not really necessary, I repeat the same strat against Gogo just to be on the safe side. This close to the end, I would hate to lose Ace because of some little mistake. Her King Amet comes out and gets a boost because all his friends are dead. Basically, he gets stronger the more you suck. I send out Queen Amet to prove once and for all which is the better sex. And even though King Amet gets a free shot and a dead friend boost, the Queen is victorious with a low kick. Well, it's official guys. Girls are better than we are. The Amets have proved it. The fake Gita's ace comes out, so I pivot to our good friend Skittles to tank an earth power and respond with a terra boosted leaf blade for the win. With that, we have not only proven that I am the real Gita, but that Gita's team is strong enough to become the champion in Paldea. But obviously, there is still one last thing for me to do. Take care of this creep who's been stalking me the entire run. Her Lycanroc leads off against Piranha, but a Choice Scarf Surf drowns the dog. Unsurprisingly, this baits out the Fakachu, so I pivot to Flathead to tank the double shot. I then use Protect, just to be on the safe side, before pivoting again, this time to Lil Fiddle, who I don't think I've used at all in this run, not really anyway. My Ostrich survives the hit and responds with a Psychic. I bring Flathead back out against the Dun Dun Sparse and make a bit of a mistake. You see, rather than jump in straight with a Body Press, which is what I had written out in the strategies, I decide to use Protect, which is stupid because Hyper Drill bypasses it. Planning me is a lot smarter than on the spot me, without a doubt. That mistake allows the long dunce bars to use coil, meaning that body press is now a three hit KO instead of a two. Man, if I lose flathead here, I'll have no one to blame but myself. But I get lucky because none of the hyper drills crit and with some leftovers healing, I survive the encounter with 34 HP left. Next is Earthworm Jim. Now a worm's natural predator is the fish. So Piranha comes out to take an iron head and drowns the worm in two surfs after taking an earthquake as well. Now a fish's natural predator is a goopy dragon thing. So I bring out Skittles on a dragon pulse, which baits out an ice beam that Queen Emmet can tank like a beast. Two cleaves broken up by a protect, again, just to be on the safe side, and the goopy dragon dies. She does lower my accuracy, but it doesn't end up mattering. This brings out Nimona's last Pokemon, Skeledurge. I decide to finish this journey the way it began, with Ace facing off against the Fire Croc. I do have an Air Balloon, again, just in case on the pivot, Skeledurge used Earth Power instead of Torch Song for some reason, but I didn't think he would. Ace survives the Torch Song and responds with a single Terra Boosted Power Gem for the Knockout. And with that, we have finished the run. And if nothing else, we have proven that it's possible for Gita to become the champion using only the Pokemon that she actually has. 
And not only is it possible, but she can do it as a hardcore Nuzlocke. Not that she's ever heard about those, because she's still a noob. All in all, the MVP of this run was certainly Glamora, because that little rock is awesome, and he's quickly becoming one of my favorite Paldean Pokemon. But putting him to the side, the next MVP would be either Gogoat or Ponyard. Even before he evolved, when he was a tiny little Ponyard, he still did a ton to help me out. So I still think it's lame, he takes forever to evolve, and then to evolve again, but even without that, he's still a pretty decent Pokemon. Which of Gita's Pokemon do you think are the best? Let me know in the comments down below, and be sure to leave a like and subscribe. Thank you so much for watching, and for reals, the next video will be in Kanto. I just had this video idea and I had to get it done before I forgot about it, so I hope you enjoyed it.